And now, here's your host, Board Certified Circumcision Reattachment Specialist, Drew Marshall. In truth, Tim, I think that's an image I could do without. Uh, yeah, but Drew you Marshall. Know, it's it's Drew's thing. He's a, in it a a reattachment specialist. specialist. Yes. Right. Putting the putzes back where they belong. That is troubling on so many levels. Yes. I can't even yes. begin to tell you. So our next guest is Baxter Kruger. He's a, a friend of mine. He's probably somewhere in Mississippi, probably not far away from Jackson. Baxter, are you with us? I'm with you. This is just a ball of confusion, man. <laughs> That's right. That's an old 80s uh, it uh, is. tune, Ball of Confusion. Ball Love of and confusion. Rockets. Love and just Rockets. The, the great pecker. That's right. <laughs> and and you know that there's very few people that can get away with calling me that, and, and you're I, like the only I one. I know. I know. <laughs> How are you, brother? I'm doing great. Doing great. We had a Canadian blast. It came down and got cold this morning. It's probably about 72 degrees. <laughs> yeah. We just had a guest on, Bob Fu, from, and he was calling from West Texas, and he's like talking about how chilly it's getting down there, and I don't know, <laughs> 60 degrees or something. I'm like, are you kidding me? You're talking to a couple of Canadians here. I think, you know, by the time I get into my car, I'll have to clear some snow off it today. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, eh? Yeah. Eh? Uh, so what are you doing today? Are you just hanging out? Or are you out in the out in the the hunting ground? Or what? What? what no, what's... I am packing. Actually, I'm going uh, first of the week to Operation Restored Warrior, which is uh, a program that's been designed for people who are um, some this amazing ministry. They heal warriors who uh, struggle with PTSD and uh, and GSD and uh, suicidal ideation is remarkable. They've had 450-something men go through, and every single one of them have been completely healed. So they've invited me to come along to the program, and uh, I'm excited about it, so I've been packing. I've got to get cold, cold clothes and stuff together. So where, where, are you heading? where are you heading? It's going to Vail, Colorado. Okay, wow. And that's be, kind of beautiful. You, you, you leaving today or tonight, or what's, what's... I will be leaving in the morning. Wow. So you got a lot going on. So if we lose you, you are actually going through your sock drawer. Is that kind of what you're telling me? <laughs> yeah, I've actually went and bought a pair of boots and uh, wow, a, he- a heavy coat. Nice. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna talk about a whole lot of things, I'm sure, over the next twenty twenty five minutes or so. But but uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about a, about an essay that you've written recently. And you've kind of taken some uh, an old theological classic and sort of turned it on its head. And I find that not only fun and funny and fascinating, but I think it's a really important uh, piece as well. And then I want to talk a little bit about the shack revisited and why you thought the shack needed to be revisited, <laughs> and um, and and maybe unpack that a little bit for us. But this, the title of the essay is "God in the Hands of Angry Sinners." You quote George MacDonald, and, and George MacDonald says that quote, "Good souls, many." Will one day be horrified at the things they now believe of God? What? Uh, why quote McDonald? I know you're a big fan, but why did that almost open up the essay? Well, George McDonald, uh, more so I think than anybody in our modern time, realized that we have really, really screwed up when it comes to the doctrine of God, and that we are hamstrung, when, and we have tarred Jesus' Father's face with the brush of our own unfaithfulness. And indeed, with the darkness of evil itself, and so we've got this, this, uh, and Jonathan Edwards' sermon, uh, um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, unfortunately, is the most famous sermon in American history. First time I read it, it was in an American literature book, um, but I, I just, we've got it completely backwards. This whole notion that somehow the Father needs to be appeased or even changed in any way is backwards. So McDonald is the one that sees that so powerfully and beautifully, and he understands the Father's heart for us, and that Jesus came because he didn't come to save us from the Father's wrath. He came to unite himself with us as we are in our brokenness and sin, and to deliver us from evil. So, so Baxter, that's Baxter are, we, are, we born, are we born for relationship, or born in relationship, or are we born sinners? Well, I don't know about you, David. I mean, that's a mystery. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, we died and we rose again in Jesus, and we ascended in Him even before we were born. So I grew up in the old Calvinist framework with um, uh, the doctrine of total depravity, which is really good for building self-image. Um, <laughs> right. And, um, right. So the answer to total depravity is yes, whatever you want to say about me, uh, I died in Jesus. 
and I rose in Jesus, and I ascended in Jesus. So it changes the entire question for me. And I said, when I say I, I'm, I'm saying we, the human race. Right, right. We died in Jesus. We rose. And that's what right. actually the whole the whole movement of of incarnation is. I, Jesus is saying, is that if you read the high priestly prayer, the last thing Jesus says in the high priestly prayer is, He says, Father, the love with which you love me, I want that to be in them, and I in them. And then he turns, in John's Gospel, he turns from that moment and goes to the cross, because he said, I'm going into the belly of the beast. I'm going down and down and into the belly of darkness, and I'm going to find my brothers and sisters, and I'm going to take them down in death and lift them up in resurrection and bring them back to you, Father. Isn't That's there, what he's doing. Isn't there a sense that, that folks, people that are, you know, maybe not on the same page, who, who kind of you know, hold up a crucifix against you or, you know, look at you and say, you know, they wear a, they wear a necklace of garlic uh, when they're around you. Um, is there a sense in which they can't even hear what you're talking about because of the, I don't know, their worldview, the lens that they're seeing things through and, and, and um, that just kind of shuts them down? I mean, I, I think I could certainly speak to that philosophically, but I wonder what you could say to it theologically. Well, we have an expression here in Mississippi, uh, bless their hearts. Uh, um, seriously, um, the, what we're dealing with here is just plain darkness. And I'm not pointing my finger at any individual person. I'm saying the whole human race is included in Jesus, and we've been blinded by to that. We've absolutely been blinded by it, and we've made agreements with darkness that we don't even know that we've made. And so we hear the truth. It goes off like a tuning fork inside of our soul, but our brains are being fried. It does not make sense because of the received framework, the worldview. You said the lens. It is the uh, it is the fallen mind, and uh, and it, we kiss like you. Are you kidding me? Are you telling me that my father in heaven has never once done anything but love me, and that that's why Jesus came because he was sent by the Father to find me in the far country and to bring me home, and he's done that. That didn't make any sense to me in my Calvinist world when I first started reading Athanasius in the early church. It just blew my mind. So this idea of this idea of a God that's you know somewhere out there that one day will get to you that's got this really big stick, you you're you're suggesting right across the board is a complete lie. Yes, I'm not suggesting it. I'm contending for it, and I am passionate <laughs> about that. Uh, let me give you a quote from Athanasius. This is one of my favorite ones. He wrote this when he was about 21. He said, the God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. Now, that, that statement, and along with another one, he said, in, in, uh, he said that what then, or what then was God being good to do when his creation was on the road to ruin and lapsing back into non-being? And that rocked my world, and I began to realize, wait a minute now, and as I read the early church, their vision of the fallen heart of God is magnificent. And it just is very difficult for us in the West right now, because the day is changing. But right now it's very difficult for us to, to, to see it. It's like, wait a minute, I thought the whole point here was that God was spitting nails angry with us because we're sinners, and, and Jesus came down to take to suffer the wrath of God in our place. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. The wrath that was poured out on Calvary's hill did not originate in the Father, and it did not originate in the Holy Spirit. It originated in the human race. We're the ones that cursed Jesus and damned him and beat him to death and poured our scorn on him. And he says, I'm taking it, boys. I'm going to take it because that's my way inside of your darkness. And I'm bringing my Father and the Holy Spirit with me. And you will never be able to kill me again. That's what it's about. So you see, for me, it is the oneness of the Father Son and Spirit's passionate determination to free us and to liberate us, that's what's driving the whole incarnation all the way to the death into resurrection and sin. Tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean by incarnation? Uh, well, I know you're a philosopher, David, but in, um, <laughs> and, they w- and, they w- and they would be theologians. That's but, right, um, yes. Incarnation is the word used to talk about the fact that the Father's eternal Son became a real human being. He became exactly what we are. Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, Irenaeus says, in his transcendent love, became what we are in order to bring us to be what he is. So the Son of God became Son of Man to make us sons and daughters of God with him, joint heirs with him of his Father and the Holy Spirit. Does that help, David? That, no, that, that absolutely helps. I think, I think 
Why does that make such a big difference, though? I mean, I remember, you know, I mean, we've had many, many conversations over the years about these things, but I'm, I'm just trying to unpack it a little bit more. Why does that really matter? I mean, is that going to, does that make, does that allow me to wa- love my wife anymore? Does that, is that going to make me a better international development worker or a better philosopher or a better father? Well, the, way, the reason it matters is because Jesus is the one who lives and dwells face to face with the Father from all eternity. He actually knows the Father. And he shares all things with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he has come to take up residence in us so that we, human beings, could begin to participate in his life and love and relationships with the Father and the Holy Spirit in our uh, relationships on planet Earth until the whole Earth, and indeed I believe the cosmos, is filled with nothing less than the very eternal life of the Father, Son, and Spirit that they've shared from all eternity. So it makes all the difference in the world. It, otherwise, we don't, have, we don't have the life of God. All we've got is some salvation that's going to allow us to go to a place called heaven one day when we die. Right, it's, it becomes like a, a, lo- a ticket, uh, a ticket a on ticket. a way out. And that is a long way away from being ushered into the very being and life and communion and oneness and love and joy and passion of the Father, Son, and Spirit themselves. I I think that's one of the reasons why I asked that question, Baxter, about, and you probably know um, the method to my madness, but the question about are we born in sin or are we born for relationship? And I mean, I think that was one of the things, you know, when I first started hearing, I mean, the first time I heard you speak was a long time ago now, and I think it was certainly before I had heard, uh, had read anything you'd written, and then we got to meet a couple of months after that. It was really quite timely. It was around when I met uh, Elizabeth before she was my wife, and I remember I remember pulling over, I think, after meeting you, and it was probably uh, around the time when cell phones were about the size of a shoebox. And, and I called you, and I said, wow, you know what? It just it kind of just hit me. This, this kind of changes everything. Absolutely does. I mean, it means that we have been given the gift of participating, of sharing in the love and the laughter and the life and the communion of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And that gift is given to us, and the, and the purpose of that gift is so that we can love one another with it. The purpose of it is so that the, the entire earth can begin to live out of that relationship with one another. And these wars and this horrendous, these horrendous injustices can begin to be defeated. And begin to be, in, and in the place of defeat, the life of the Trinity begin to be manifested. That's what it means. Otherwise then we're not talking about relationship, we're not talking about union, what we're talking about is a distant God way up there who has given to us a manual on how to live life. That is very different from saying what we've inherited in Jesus is the Father himself and all that he has and is, and our inheritance is the Holy Spirit and all of the Holy Spirit's gifts. That's what we've inherited and we're being called to live out of. We're called to agree to that and live live that out in our marriages and relationships, and it's hard work. But man, to be able to know that I can begin to love my wife and my children and my family and my friends with nothing less than the love of the Father, Son, and Spirit, that's inexhaustible. You, that's, I, rem- that's what, I remember one of your phrases I just love from, I think, from the book The Great Dance. Uh, you, you refer to God as a faceless, austere omni-being. <laughs> yeah, the that's faceless, awesome. nameless omni-being up there somewhere watching you from the instant distance of a disapproving heart. <laughs> that's That's right. Yeah. That's almost self-referentially incoherent, but I figured <laughs> you being a philosopher will understand it. <laughs> I love that phrase. Oh, man, yes. What what I wouldn't give now for a, a, a 15-year-old scotch and a cigar. I mean, what's going on? We, we, uh, Where's Michael Lafleur when you need him? That's right, exactly. So, so you wrote a book recently. Uh, the, I mean, it's it's kind of in some regards. Uh, uh, I was going to say culmination, wrong word, but it's a collection almost of some of your thoughts in 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 connection to the shack. Uh, Paul Young's uh, wonderful book, uh, the novel, sold close to 20 million copies now. And I, I love, I've got a copy of the book here in front of me, and the, the tagline is: "There is more going on here than you ever dared to dream." Tell us about that a little bit more. I mean, I think that's connected to McDonald's comment about about the horrible things we're going to believe about God. I mean, I, and, and this and misappropriation of this faceless, austere omni being that was re, that really wants to just embrace and include, not um, divorce and ignore. Does does not he does not merely want to embrace and include? He has embraced and included, and because we have been included in Jesus. 
and in his own relationship with the Father, and in his own anointing in the Holy Spirit, there is way more going on in our life than we've ever even dared to dream. And that's the whole point of the New Testament calling us to what is it's a horrible translation, uh, but the word repentance. The Greek word is metanoia, and it means a radical change of the way you see things, the way you see God, the way you see yourself, the way you see other human beings, the way you see planet Earth. So what I'm saying is that we have been included. This is a fact. This is something Jesus accomplished. This is something to be proclaimed to the world. And when everybody looks at it and says, well, it doesn't look that way to me, they say, yeah, that's because now what we need to do is we need to agree with it. We need to change our minds Mm -hmm. and our hearts and begin to live this out. And live live it out. And why do and why do you think? And I've seen this happen. I mean, we've 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 worked together many times. And um, why do people sometimes really get their hackles up about that? And, and never mind their hackles, but really get you know metaphysically pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> well, they may need a four foot. Uh, no, no, uh, I'll change. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they get. We all have. Every single one of us in our darkness has found, has tried to find something or a group of things that will give us some comfort and some relief. It may be drugs, it may be uh, football, I mean, it's just pick one. Most of us go through one after another because they don't have the power to actually work. But when you somebody comes along and exposes the emptiness of something that you believe and you're trying to squeeze to make life come out of it, I mean, that, that creates... Um, friction to say the least and that's happened again and again and again throughout history and it's not simply just about when the gospel's preached it's when anybody's challenged when you're received dogma or your basic ideas are challenged then you you go on defense until the holy spirit this is like the apostle i mean saul of tarsus great illustration there he is he is the kingpin of the pharisees buddy and he realizes this jesus thing has got to stop well, we're going to lose. He is threatened to the core. He goes on a tear, and he's killing Christians. And then, and this is so powerful, David. In 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 Acts, when it says that a light was shining from heaven and addressed him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you? Who are you, Lord? He knew instantly that it was the Lord that was speaking, but he didn't know who it was. And when he said, I'm Jesus. Saul of Tarsus, the dude that had the entire Old Testament memorized, it could argue anybody in the dirt, suddenly, and without a word, without a single word, uh, swore allegiance in his soul to Jesus. He thought he was dead wrong, and he saw it, and that's a massive confusion. I mean, and so then he had to go away for three years to sort it out in his brain, because he had, he was kept imposing on God and God's story his own pharisaical ideas. And he had a lot invested in it. So and, when you, you, and, that, and so that, I think it's our investment. And I, yep. I'm not asking anybody to be Trinitarian. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is walk with Jesus. And I can guarantee you as you walk with Jesus, he's going to introduce you to his Father, and it's going to blow your mind because he is good. Not, not, he's not a split personality. What do you mean by uh, you make the comment in, in the essay, um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and I want you to talk a little bit more about that title in a second, and I think we kind of are unpacking that. You but just, You just flip, you flip the title. You said sorry, Sinners in sorry, the Hands of an Angry God. There you go. God in the Hands of Angry Sinners. That's how deep it goes. <clears throat> what, what, what do you mean that we all breathe Christological air? I think it's a really f- amazing phrase, but, but it sounds difficult. Tell me, tell me what that means. Well... <clears throat> There's only one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, one Creator. All things are created in and through and by and for Jesus Christ. And John is emphatic at the very beginning of his Gospel. He says not one thing, not a single atom or anything in this universe has come into being, not, not only through God. He is specific. He's saying through the Word, through the Son, through Jesus. So everything that is, everything you will ever see in all the creation, has its existence in and through Jesus. And John Calvin is beautiful on that passage in John because he says, what well, he says, if, if Jesus were to remove himself from us, human beings, or from this planet, it would instantly, we would all instantly vanish. So my point in the phrase, we're all breathing Christological air, is to call people's attention to the fact, wait a minute, Jesus is not only our Savior, he's our Creator. And, and and as Paul says in, in Colossians chapter 1, is it that he is not only the creator, but all things not only are called into being through him, but he constantly sustains everything. This is one of the fundamental flaws in my mind in terms of what's happened with us in our Western conversation. 
we don't talk about Jesus being the creator. That's where the New Testament, that's where John starts his gospel. That's where Paul starts Ephesians. This is the relationship. Jesus has a relationship with all creation. Everything is breathing Christological air, and we don't know who we are. He comes into it himself and becomes a human being. And as he does, he's not breaking his existing relationship with his Father or the Holy Spirit, and he's not breaking his relationship with all things. He's now establishing his relationship with all creation in his humanity. And then he's going to go to the cross and say, I'm going to establish my relationship with the human race and all creation inside your rejection of me and inside your murder of me. So it's a huge, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's foundational. And fundamental. And l- let me guess that this is part of the reason why you thought the shack needed to be revisited. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we, uh, the beautiful part to me, it rocked me. I, I just almost fell out of my deer stand when I was, that's where I read the shack. Is when you, you fell read, out of your what? I almost fell out of my deer stand. Right, because we all know what that is. Well, I mean, I, there's probably a few Canadians that like to hunt. <laughs> there's a few, yeah. Hey? <laughs> hey? Yeah. I heard about somebody last week, uh, Baxter, you'd, appro- you'd approve, uh, of going turkey hunting with a bow. Uh, that, that's got to be pretty hard. That sounds like, to me, a, uh, what we're talking about, an investment <laughs> trying to find <laughs> themselves. <laughs> no. So you nearly, fan- not- you nearly fell out of your deer stand? What, what, what happened? I was sitting in my deer stand, and I, and I read in the shack where Papa... Chapter 5, where Mackenzie finally see the whole thing is, what I love so about the shack is the whole the whole first part of it is about G.O.D., the faceless, nameless omni being who's watching this from the infinite distance of a disapproving heart. And, and Mackenzie's going back to have a showdown with this God, G.O.D., and he goes back in the shack, and there's nothing there. Mm. That's the no-show. And, and, and uh, I'm thinking, this he can't mean what this is saying. And then the next thing, he leaves the shack, and then he comes back, and it's all changed. And his first, his first hint is he thinks he hears laughter coming from the shack. And you got two different doctrine of gods right there at that point. One's G.O.D. that was a no-show. Now somebody's inside the shack laughing. And so he turns and goes back, and who's inside the shack? And the shack represents the human soul and his brokenness. And Papa and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are already inside. And Max still fuming at G.O.D. And it takes him the whole weekend to begin to realize that I'm in relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit. And that's what the human journey is about. The human journey is about us in our shacks coming to realize that the Father, Son, and Spirit have already made their way inside of us and inside of our brokenness. And all of me, and all of my war-torn fragments, and all of my guilt-ridden, shame, and broken parts. All of that is bound up in Jesus, in the Father, in the Holy Spirit. Now, it's about me coming to wake up to who I am. And that's what it's about us coming to wake up and begin to believe and begin to walk in the freedom and authority of this. And that's what I saw in the shock. And I'm like, this can't be. I mean, that just sounded like J.P. Torrance. So first chance I had to speak to Paul about it, and I said, man, are you, were you serious? Or did you just kind of fall into this? Or were you making a statement here? He said, oh, no. He said, and then I began to understand by his own life and the hell that he had been through. And he said, that's what happened to me, Baxter. He said, my life fell apart, and I was standing on the edge of the abyss of non-being. And the Father, Son, and Spirit showed up inside of me. And so that's the gospel. The gospel is the Father, Son, and Spirit are already inside of you. Wake up. I love this, I- I love this idea, Baxter, about, about all of us breathing Christological air. I think, you know, you and I have chatted about the implications for how we love our wives, how we treat our children, how we teach our students, how we do our development, how we uh, politicize our worldview and so on. And I think, I think you know, it really does change everything. Um, we got to go. We, we got to go, Baxter, and I hate that. Um, we've got to go to commercial, if you can believe that. I don't think I've ever said that. And now we have to go to commercial. Um, uh, the Shack Revisited by C. Baxter Kruger. It's published uh, here by Hachette Books. It's a steal, folks, for what? About $15, I think, online. You can pick it up. Do it. It's an amazing read um, from a dear friend of mine, Baxter Kruger. Love you, brother. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, David. Give Elizabeth and Spencer and Victoria a big shout for me. I will, indeed. And we'll talk to you real soon. Thank you. Okay, man. Thanks for joining us here today, (laughs) and uh, we'll be right back. People gonna stoop and bow. All 